thank you, and, and thank you for having me in your wonderful city for this wonderful event. Although I, I have to be very honest with you is that after a couple of weeks of international travel, I'm a little bit ready to get home to Dallas, Texas. And that got pretty complicated starting yesterday. Um, and as I was running around the conference here with my head buried into my phone, looking up flights and trains and booking in different languages than I natively speak, I realized how different the world is and how different that situation is than it even would have been a few years ago, much less 10 years ago. You can imagine that 10 years ago, I might not have known that I wasn't going home until after the talk here and I show up at the airport only to find out my flight has been canceled. And that difference between then and now, to me, is what the power of technology is in the travel space and the impact it can have in a short amount of time. That's why within Sabre, I'm very lucky and very passionate about the team that I lead, which is Sabre Labs. And that team is about exploring technologies, early technologies, to figure out where they fit into this travel landscape. And that happens on a time horizon that can be pretty close in, 12 to 24 months, or one that can be far out a decade or more into the future. And we do this through three disciplines First is that we research, there are dozens of technologies that are on our radar that we keep tabs on to read about, to know, and to think about how they impact travel, but a few of them get through the process to actually be explored. And I've got a team, a small team of developers that builds working prototypes using these technologies in travel context. And you'll be able to see some of those uh, prototypes today. And then we share. We share internally with our product teams because we believe these technologies are important and Sabre's able to bring them to market at a scale that impacts the whole industry. But we also share them with our customers to get validation and with the industry at large. And one of the ways that we've done that with the industry is recently releasing uh, the Emerging Technology and Travel Report for 2017. Uh, this report uh, goes through uh, the mega trends that we think are important to travel that you can act on this year, but have ripples out into the next decade. And those mega trends that we're going to spend our time talking about today are conversational interfaces, digital realities, and connected intelligence. And I want you to come into these with an open mind because we understand that um, you may not be using some of these technologies maybe in your house or in your company today. But I love this quote by William Gibson, that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. So these technologies and these use cases that we're gonna talk about are real. They are happening in the world. And our job in labs and our job today is to even out that distribution so that you get a full view into the landscape of emerging travel and technology. And we're going to do that first with conversational interfaces. So conversational interfaces represent a shift in the way that we interact with machines. Uh, anyone in here uh, use punch cards to tell a machine what to do? Any punch card people? Oh, we got a fairly young audience. OK, great. Um, oh, there was one in the back. Good job. Punch cards, then the progression to a keyboard and a mouse. And then we change to using touch as the primary way that we interact with machines. And conversational interfaces is about making the progression to using our natural language, whether that be spoken or typed, to interact and tell uh, computer systems what we'd like to do and have them respond to us. The two main technologies, as I mentioned, that, that are part of this mega trend are message-based interfaces and voice-based interfaces. So we're gonna start with a poll question just to see the engagement in the room. And this poll question um, is about how often you are using these conversational interfaces today. So I'm gonna read the question first and once I get through the answers, you're only gonna have 10 seconds to answer. So you're gonna have to be on top of it today. Um, how often do you use conversational interfaces, things like Siri, Google Now, um, Amazon Echo, or Facebook Messenger, or chat applications. How often do you use those um, in your home? So one is several times a day, 
two is once, de- once a day, three is once a week, four is less than once a week, and five is the never answer. I don't use these things at all. So you have 10 seconds starting now. That is cool music. Oh, great. This is a great room. Several times a day. Uh, So you're already well informed about uh, these conversational interfaces. And it's funny, we see an inverse curve here, right? The second biggest answer is never. So quite a divided room. And some of you that are already uh, buying into these technologies and some of you that uh, aren't yet. So the next poll question I think is interesting, especially for those of you who are less than once a week or never. What do you think... Um, the biggest barrier is to using conversational interfaces for you. Why do you not use these conversational interfaces? One, unfamiliar with the technology. Two, I've tried it before and was not happy with it. Three, the lack of language support. Four, privacy concerns. And then five, there's no barriers. I'm already a regular user. So we'll start the poll. You again have 10 seconds and maybe we get cool music again. Let's go. Okay, well, of course, the regular users already we talked about. Um, I've tried it, not happy with the result. I think that's a a very legitimate claim. Um, A lot of early systems in this uh, were not good. But we'll talk about some of the progressions that we've seen um, in this space. Because as we can tell from the room a little bit, uh, this is an area uh, that is heating up. And so stats that we're seeing from different parts of the world in the U.S., Android has said that one in five of the searches that are happening on their device are being done via voice. And you may say, oh, well, that's a mobile thing. Windows has said that on Windows 10, one in four of their searches are done via voice from Windows 10 on a desktop environment. And then talking about messaging bots and talking about generational differences, 58% of millennials claim they've used some kind of messaging bot interface. So this is happening in the world. The question is, how does it happen in travel? And Gartner's even even come out and said a stronger statement that by 2020, uh, the average person will have more conversations with bots than with their spouse. So the next poll question is, is this a good thing for you or not? No, I'm just kidding. That's not a poll question. Um, We're not going to do that to you here. (laughs) But like we say, these these interfaces affect more than just relationships. Uh, They affect uh, what's going on in travel, and we see that happening in three ways. Uh, The first is from a shopping and original point of booking context. See a lot of startups, a lot of OTAs, and beginning some of the supplier brands to allow you to, whether it's through a messaging platform or through voice, to say something like, I want to be at ITB Berlin in 2018 and arrive on Tuesday. How expensive are flights and where can I stay? That kind of natural language intention around um, your original shopping request. The second thing we see is in service and support. So uh, a request that... I'm stuck at ITB 2017. I was supposed to fly out of Berlin this afternoon. Uh, Can you help me get home? Using it as an avenue for service and support. And then the third that we see is merchandising. And merchandising is a little blurred out because on the first two examples, we actually can talk about different uh, travel people that are adopting these. The third one we haven't quite seen yet, but signs are obviously pointing in that direction. One of the reasons is that uh, the context that you get, either from the original shopping request in natural language, remember I said I'm going to ITB, you don't get that today if I just fill out your form on the web. You don't get it. Or the service and support request that says I'm stuck and I need to get home to Dallas because I have something really important on Saturday. You don't have that context unless you have a natural language. And so we think this merchandising piece of being able to say, oh, you, you're in th- um, what seat am I in on the plane? Well, you're in 31B, but for $49, you could be in 14C. These are the types of interactions we expect to see in this space. And so with message-based interfaces being the first technology, we'll dive quickly into to what that means within the conversational context. And the reason we do this is this is where people are spending time. Obviously, from the room, 
over a billion monthly active users on the global messaging platform, WhatsApp and Facebook. And then when you get into some of the regional ones that have great penetration, you see millions and millions of people spending time on their mobile devices on these interfaces. So it's about meeting them where they are. And we imagine a world where your mobile phone evolves from this big collection of apps to what's going on in WeChat is a few chosen providers through one of their screens, but also this idea of a contact list that has all of the brands I would like to interact with alongside people I do as well. The top one is actually my wife, uh, so I'm still talking to my spouse more than a bot, even in my life, but it's not 2020 yet. Um, and one of the bots that we've built to that end is Project Logan that I'd like to give you a glimpse of now. Sound? So the most interesting thing that I've gotten a chance to work on recently is Project Logan. It's a AI engine that allows you to ask questions about your trip at any time that you want to ask it. Right now, we can talk to Logan through Facebook Messenger. You can text Logan any questions you have. You can talk to Logan through Twitter. I'm about to go to San Francisco in a few days on a business trip. So I'm going to ask it, what is my flight departure? It answers back your flight, and it gives you your flight ID, is on time, departing from DFW gate D20 at 7.20 a.m. Where's my hotel? So I've landed and I'm getting my information. Where's my hotel? So if I can click on this address right here when I'm standing in line to get my baggage, I can actually, it'll bring up an Uber or a Lyft option. I can even ask it questions via emoji. So if I send it the flight departure emoji, it'll say my flight is scheduled to depart at 7.20 a.m. You can also ask it things like, is there TSA pre-check available? Or does my hotel have a gym? Does my hotel have a bar? Uh, what is my hotel address? In more in-depth questions, we're trying to get as much information as possible. We believe that there's a big future in what I'll call conversational commerce. So we wanna be able to build in a way that you can talk to this anytime in the most easy and painless way that really integrates into the way that you do your day-to-day -day living. And so that's a look at Logan, a messaging bot that we built to show how this can impact travel. Logan's not the only bot that we built. This one is Saber Labsy, one for you. If you're not interacting with bots, this is one that can be a kind of my first bot experience on the Facebook Messenger platform. If you go to the URL on the slide, just in your mobile browser, it'll queue you up and show you how to interact with this bot. And you can say hello and start interacting with uh, one of these conversational bots on Facebook Messenger. And we said that conversational is more than just typing, it's more than just messaging platforms, it's also voice. Again, we're seeing voice in more of a kind of service and support realm today in travel. Uh, the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas has dedicated to put Amazon Echoes in every one of their rooms by the end of the year and use them to do requests that you might call the front desk for today, or that uh, they're also looking at some of the room automation to say, turn on my lights, um, or turn down, bring down the curtains. So uh, using these voice technologies in a service and support role, because what we find as we survey people is that uh, shopping on these voice platforms is very hard, because shopping without a screen is hard. We become very accustomed to having visual feedback of what we want to purchase, and even purchasing a $5 item through the Amazon Echo can be difficult to make sure you know what you're getting, much less a $500 or $5,000 item, which tends more towards travel. But this is something that we're going to figure out because just like a generation that grew up with young children that had iPads and they thought everything was a screen you could touch and it should react, my kids, I've got three young daughters, seven, six, and two, we have an Amazon Echo at home, and they believe they can talk to any piece of technology. And so the conversations that happen in my day are Alexa, play Frozen by my seven-year-old and my six-year-old. And yes, even my two-year-old talks to Alexa. Alexa doesn't quite understand her. But this is what's happening, and this is what a next generation will expect as a way to interact with these technologies. But it's more than just those conversational interfaces. Digital realities uh, can have a profound impact on the travel industry as well. By digital realities, we're talking about virtual reality, augmented reality, and merged reality. 
And they can do this by, doing, by improving the inspiration or the retailing experience, by offering entertainment to travelers, by offering in-trip information, and also by offering training and maintenance for the companies that operate and run these travel experiences. The first is virtual reality, so a full immersive experience that can range from something like this, which is sticking your phone into a piece of cardboard, to a high-end system that's like the Sony PlayStation 4 and the VR that goes with it. And what we see early days in this is inspirational content, showing me a destination that I may want to go to. But uh, over the last year, we've seen airlines and hotels start to use this as product-level virtual reality to show their products in a virtual way. This is United Polaris. Before the business class was in the plane, it was in virtual reality for you to experience. And we see hoteliers and airlines trying to use this as a way to differentiate their products. Not only to differentiate their products, but also to offer entertainment to their travelers and their guests. Uh, virtual reality has a limited scope of when you can use it. My team likes to say, don't use VR anywhere you wouldn't take a nap. Um, because closing yourself off from the world makes you very vulnerable to what's going on around it. The good news is travel has a lot of those places in an airplane cabin, in your room in a hotel. There's lots of places that you could use virtual reality as an entertainment device safely in travel contexts. But augmented reality is about putting a digital layer on top of the real world. So you're not stepping away from it, you're stepping into uh, this real world. And so we've seen this for a little while through the phone lens, is that I can use my phone to change my experience around me. This is Google Translate, that you can point at a sign and it translates it for you right on your phone. But we think it's more than just the experiences these augmented realities can change. Uh, as Pokemon Go came onto the scene last year, this idea of digital goods, digital things that exist in the real world, in certain places, we think is really interesting. And so this idea that I would travel to a place and collect something that is digital instead of physical and bring that back with me, uh, we think is really intriguing for travel to think about. And mixed and merged reality is going the next step, not just looking at that digital item, but being able to interact with that. And we've been experimenting quite a bit with the Microsoft HoloLens, which is a headset device, so not through your phone, but worn on your head, uh, that we think can change the way the operations work in travel. And I'm going to show you that video now. Saber Labs has been exploring augmented reality and how it might apply to travel. With augmented reality, there's just that additional layer that's on top of what you're already seeing, so that you have additional interactions available on top of your world. We were exploring augmented reality and the HoloLens in particular. We focused in on travel and what we could do there, specifically realizing that we can place two windows next to each other and have them interact. We created Project HoloFlights. Interaction is super easy. You can use voice to talk to your headset or gestures to move and adjust the holograms. Project HoloFlights allows you to display two windows. On the left-hand side, the window is displaying the DFW tarmac, and on the right, we have a display window with the details of any given flight. So we can select a flight on the tarmac, and the screen on the right updates with the details about that flight. You can see the flight number, intended destination, departure, and arrival times for that flight. Augmented reality is just getting started as far as the technology goes, and it's exciting for us to be able to create new applications that are going to be relevant in travel very soon, and Project Hall of Flights can be taken many steps further, and this is just the beginning for us. And so this is not something just we're playing with. Uh, we've seen Japanese airlines working with Microsoft uh, to develop training programs for their pilots that run on the Microsoft HoloLens. So the idea that I can still see my hands, but that you've created a virtual console, a virtual cockpit around me, means that this could be your new flight simulator. Really exciting uh, to think about the uh, ways this can change the way that airlines and hotels run their businesses and do training and maintenance. And then connected intelligence, which is this blend of the physical and software worlds. You may know this 
If you have a, a buzzword bingo card, this is where you would get that out. Connected intelligence, this internet of things, AI, big data, machine learning, all of these things we bring together into a category we call connected intelligence. And what that means to us is data and sensors plus connectivity plus algorithms. And the Nest thermostat is actually a very good example of that because thermostats have had sensors in them since the beginning of the thermostat. Right, that's how they were able to turn on your air conditioning or your heater. But the Nest thermostat takes it a step further and connects to your phone. It connects to the weather. It connects to other Nest thermostats in your neighborhood if you want it to. And then it can start putting algorithms on top of it, which is more than just turn on, turn off when the sensor says, it's I know Mark left the house, I can turn off for a little while. Or it looks like it's going to be a really hot day, I can turn on for a little bit. So this idea of combining the data and the sensors and the connectivity and the algorithms is what makes connected intelligence. So time for another poll question. Connected intelligence is about these connected devices. And so we're talking about devices that are not cell phones, not iPads, and not laptops. How many do you have in your house a, a device that has an IP address? Your smart TV, your Apple TV, your Roku device, your thermostat. Anybody out there with a thermostat? I even have my scale. How many um, do you have connected to the internet? Zero, one to five, six to 10, or 11 plus? Go. Okay, no, all right, one to five, kind of leading the way. Most people out there, that's really cool. In fact, uh, some of the stats that we see uh, measuring close to that is that if you look at uh, connected devices, back to the slides, there are over, um, back to this one, there are over 10 billion connected devices today. Two billion smartphones in the world, not counted in there. 10 billion connected devices, about five per every phone, kind of representative of this room here. Now, what's interesting is we expect five times that in just three years' time from various estimates that we've seen. Um, people making use of this in travel, GE and their newest engines for like the 747, uh, these engines generate between five and 10 terabytes of data every single day. That much data by that jet engine every single day. And so we see this being used for things like increasing efficiencies in your staff or your operations, or to track the movement of people and things. We're looking at the technologies that do this indoor location technology because uh, GPS is a great way to track people when they're not in buildings. Satellites have a hard time seeing into a building like this. Um, so we've been using lots of different technologies, including beacon and Bluetooth technology and Wi-Fi to be able to find where you are uh, in a given place because proximity-based location can be very good for many travel applications. Proximity means I need to know that you're in this room. Precision-based means I need to know what chair you're in, and that gets pretty hard. We've been experimenting in that space and many other are as well. For some use cases, you have to have that, but many in travel, you don't. In fact, we're gonna show you now one of the prototypes that we've been working on called the Beaconator, which brings this idea of uh, digital uh, analytics into physical spaces. So today we're gonna to talk about uh, the Beaconator. So indoor location is the problem that we were trying to tackle it's more difficult than just location in general, where am I in the world? Because indoors, you don't have access to the satellites that drive GPS. We use Bluetooth beacons for that. And so we can, instead of saying you're at this coordinate, you're at this latitude and longitude, you're near this beacon. And that beacon might be the perfume counter at you know, the department store, or it might be gate A1 at the airport. So the Beaconator is this dashboard that has a bunch of really colorful charts. So the chord diagram shows how people move from one room or one space to another. The width of those cords that connect the spaces show you how, how intense that connection is. So how many people move in a hotel context from the lobby to the bar. 
and then, and then the Sunburst can show the percentages of those connections. So you've got, I don't know, 14% of the people start in the lounge and then half of them go on to the restaurant, for example. So then we scroll down here and we see uh, there's a heat map that shows hour by hour and area by area how many people are in those areas. It can give you a sense of, is there a concentration of people in the restaurant or in their rooms? So we're able to take all this complex data that's coming in from all these devices as it sees all these beacons and make these beautiful data visualizations. And so you have actionable data that anybody can understand. So we see a, a cool application of proximity-based uh, indoor location, but precision-based indoor location is needed for the next technology, which is automation and robotics. And by robots, we're talking about like real robots. Um, we see these, listen, we're seeing a lot of things right now that I would call a little bit gimmicky in this space. We don't see physical robots replacing human interaction. We see them aiding again in the support and operation of travel companies and in travel situations. So this is the Relay robot that is in 30 hotels today, mostly in the US, but just launched their first into Singapore. And this robot, you can drop a towel or a water bottle in at the front desk, tell it what room to go to, and it'll go to the elevator and go up the elevator and go to the person's room and deliver that to them. A lot of these robots that we're seeing uh, drive off of the technologies that we're seeing in autonomous vehicles, which is another kind of talk all into itself about the future of travel in autonomous vehicles. But the way we think about this is, is very similar to the way we thought about the space program, which of all of the innovations that came from getting us to space made the world a much more technologically advanced place. And we're seeing that happen with the advancements in autonomous vehicles. But we haven't given up on space altogether. Um, if you keep up with space exploration and SpaceX, um, then you know that we're getting closer and closer to this idea of making it cheaper to go to space uh, through using uh, connected intelligence to propel a rocket up into the air and then be able to land that booster back down. That is a great, great advancement in what we can do and represents uh, another huge leap forward. And those are some of the things that we're looking at, but you didn't come just to hear me talk about this stuff. You came to hear Brecky and I talk about this stuff. So I want to invite uh, Brecky Fletcher, Fletcher uh, the executive editor of CNN Travel Up, and we're going to extend this conversation even further. Great, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Brecky Fletcher. Um, I'm the executive editor of CNN Travel. Um, Mark and I have had the great pleasure of discussing how technology is influencing travel, and we'll continue that conversation here on stage. And when we're done chatting, we will invite you to ask some questions as well. So to start, Mark, um, how would you describe the difference between how the travel industry reacts to new technology versus how the regular day-to-day -day traveler mm -hmm. interacts? I mean, it's quite a big difference. One, I think it's important to realize that the, the travel, is fairly, travel is fairly new to this travel technology game. If you think back 10 years ago, my advanced technology for traveling in trip was the manila folder. Um, so you, you think about that technology, travel companies have been using technology since the 50s, and travelers are, are just now coming to this game. Now, what that means is that th that technology is changing from a very operationally minded technology in travel to more experiential. Because when travelers engage with it, they want experience. And so what you're seeing is airlines and hotels and agencies have to key on that and say, oh, my traveler needs an experience, not just an operational efficiency through that technology. So I think those are two different lenses they take to it. And I, I think that you see the early stages of travel and technology kind of moving towards that traveler experience. You discussed um, VR and <laughs> I thought the most interesting um, aspect of your VR uh, uh, speech was, uh, don't use VR anywhere you can't take a nap. Um, to that end, uh, CNN is is just launched its VR channel, and one of the content pieces that we uh, shared was running with the bulls in Pamplona. Now that's something that most people 
won't end up doing, but to be there and feel like you're there is a very exciting um, notion. So what do you think? Is it gonna be a big part of travel in the future or is it just something that we're playing around with? We still don't know what its applications can be for the consumer. Yeah, I think the big question there is uh, the consumer adoption of the headset. So we've got about, Sony reports about a million PlayStation VRs out there. There's, there's only a few million consumer VR headsets compared to two billion smartphones. So you, you kind of say, okay, what's the use case of that? And so I think for the interim, uh, there are some really good places, some controlled environments, whether it's in an agency, in a hotel room, where I think you can start providing these experiences. And so I think that we'll see that happen first and then see if the headsets make their way into living rooms. Do you think they will? I think eventually they will. I think we have to figure out another piece we, t we were discussing with our team as a shared experience with VR. What does that look like? In fact, someone was talking about one that was here today where it was a VR room that you walked into and all the walls were the 3D content. I thought that was really unique to think about how do you share a VR experience. Well, that's really interesting. Um, so past VR, what, is, what are the developments or the near developments, the science nonfiction? <laughs> oh, I was, gonna, I was gonna do teleportation. Okay. Um, Teleportation, we've looked into it, it's hard. Um, <laughs> it's one of the things on our radar, for real. Um, in theory, we can take an atom and transmit its data to another atom. Uh, the problem is it destroys the original atom. Um, so downside, not big downside, downside for travelers. Um, no, but for real, uh, the near-term development is in these conversational systems, is in these bots, is in these voice interfaces. It's where you're going to see a lot of movement this year uh, and into next year on where people uh, are, are trying to make this work. And that's where I would focus energy. Energy on not destroying yourself. Uh, it, yes. <laughs> take, take teleportation, put it over here, and work on a bot. Um, do you think augmented reality is the most immediate application for the traveler in terms of new technology that makes traveling easier? Yeah, so augmented reality has the ability to be with you anywhere, right? Either through the phone or through some kind of less bulky headset. And so uh, Tim Cook said he thinks augmented reality is bigger than mobile. So I, I think you don't say that lightly. And I think that's something that we should pay attention to, uh, that these augmented experiences can improve the traveler experience significantly when you talk about either visual or we didn't get into auditory, where you could actually hear a content that's not really there. And so you could have a tour overlaid uh, as you're walking throughout a city that knows where you are. And we think that's interesting as well. I think that would be an incredibly ideal uh, addition to my experience when I'm a traveler walking through a city I don't know, mm -hmm. having uh, the audio explained to me where I'm standing, what's the history of the building I'm standing in front of, where the nearest Starbucks might be in case you need a coffee, et cetera. So that sounds really cool. Um, you brought up space, and I'm wondering about space. Would you be one of the first travelers on the SpaceX rocket, or is, is going to wait? Is that a CNN-sponsored trip? I asked Jeff. <laughs> I did. I asked Jeff Zucker to give uh, give Elon Musk a call to see if we could be the first ones on. I I, I think it's really cool. I think that um, I think that with all travel we see questions are always around cost and safety, and so no different in, in space tourism. Uh, can you do it affordably? There have been uh, less than a dozen people who have done. Uh, space tourism, I think the average price they've paid is somewhere between 20 and $40 million a piece. Um, so that makes it pretty price prohibitive. And, but they've all come back safely, so that's good. Um, and so I think that uh, you have those concerns. I would do it. Like, I don't, I don't have the 40 mil just hanging around. But uh, I would do it because I think that, uh, I think it's exciting. I think it's exciting for us as an industry to put that out there as something that we can continue to do and continue to push ourselves of what it means to travel and to know more and take those experiences back with you. That's what this travel thing is, is always about. It's about going somewhere and learning something and taking that back with you and having it uh, change you. So yeah, I'm up for it. Okay, let's start the Kickstarter for Mark to go to Mark space. Mark to go, uh, go fund me. We only need there we uh, go. 20 to 40 million. I'll only take 10% of that. <laughs> should be good. Um, why don't we open up 
the question and answer to the audience. Does anybody want to ask Mark a burning question about his presentation or the future or technology or his pocket square? Yes. <laughs> you, you, yes. Yeah, and then we'll repeat the question. For example, like, uh, you know, iBeacons. Everybody is putting big on that, but maybe nobody will enable Bluetooth and you will fail on that. So how do you choose the directions and how often you fail? So the question is, how often do, uh, how do we choose which projects to work on and how often do we fail? Uh, we fail a lot. Um, that's not a bad thing for us. In fact, we read a, a stat uh, the other day that was an estimated 96% of innovation efforts fail. Don't make it to market. And we kind of went through a catalog of our products and thought we were doing okay in life um, based against that stat. So we fail quite a bit. Um, how do we choose what to work on? We actually take the research that we do. Each quarter we sit down and we pick three of the technologies to dig into. And so that's a combination of questions that we're getting from industry events like this. It's things that we're seeing in the space. And we pick three of those to work on. Sometimes we end up revisiting technology. Uh, we're on our second round of blockchain exploration right now, um, just because it's come up again after we explored it last year, and we think it deserves another look. So that's an insight into to how we do that. Another question, perhaps? Yes. That's you. you. Do we want to get a microphone over? She's moving fast. She doesn't have good music. She needs background music. <laughs> um, on the poll question where, uh, about the po problems um, for why you would not be able to use bots or chat bots and all this kind of stuff, um, I was kind of missing the question of the multi-language barrier. And I was wondering if that's on the horizon. And by that, I mean um, my Siri is in English but I live in Germany, or if I travel wherever, and I want to say, bring me to Rheinstrasse, uh, it has no clue what Rheinstrasse is, and the best I can do is try to just incorrectly pronounce it mm -hmm. to get there. Um, I was wondering if that's something. Yeah, it's one of the, the spaces when you talk about lingual, it's also a, what we would call a domain problem, so that there are certain places that are unique to travel or unique to a location that um, we would call a part of a, a domain, a natural language domain. And so the goal is to figure out which of those are common that we can use common platforms for. And for travel and technology providers, which ones do we need to build ourselves? So which ones do we need to know different things about different places to be able to provide that experience? Because there's a, there's a great example floating around online of there's a men's, U.S. men's college basketball coach, Coach K, Mike Krzyzewski. And if you say, how old is Mike Krzyzewski into your iPhone, it will not translate, it won't get the words right. But the answer will come back right because the added layer of domain means, oh, I don't know what those words are. Oh, but that kind of looks like this coach's name. And you said coach, and I feel strongly that you were trying to say this, and so I'll give you the age back. So it's kind of a multi-step process that is, is still really early days. Um, but it's, we're getting the problem into chunks that you know whether I'm solving it or whether someone else is solving it. So I think that's an important step. That was a great question. Um, anyone else in the audience have a question for Mark? Going once. <laughs> Going twice. Oh, way in the back. Way in the back? Oh, good. The mic is coming to you. It's like we strategically placed them. It was yes, here. Yes, as far away from the here. next question must come from over there. <laughs> Optimized discomfort. <laughs> question would be. Um, does Sabre Labs look into areas like uh, biometrics and uh, looking more at, you know, recognition, you know? I mean, there, there are certain companies that experiment with implants and certain things that, uh, is that something you're considering as well in your uh, roadmap? That, that's, uh, so uh, biometrics for sure, one of the things last year we built facial recognition prototype for an airport kiosk. Um, so, so biometrics in general, yes, something we're interested in. The biohacking strain of that, the implant strain, is something we haven't 
quite gotten into yet. We keep tabs on it. We watch it. We know that there's been a guy that boarded a plane with an RFID chip in his hand as his boarding pass. Like, we know all of those stories. Um, my insurance in the U.S. doesn't cover any of those right now. Um, and so until it does, it's a little hard for me to experiment um, with those implants. But definitely something that we're keeping tabs on and interested in. For us in that space, it's going to be more of knowing what that space looks like, I'm not going to be making medical implants at Sabre. I don't think that's any breaking news. Uh, but how do those implants integrate with our systems and the systems of the travel companies is where we look at uh, participating. OK, I think that's all we have time for. Um, I want to thank Mark for his extraordinary presentation. I think it's given us a lot to think about. And um, I just got myself some Labsy on Facebook Messenger. That's so right. I'm going to be asking some questions of Labsy when we're done. And we'll work on getting to space. Great. Space X? Jeff Bezos? Yeah, we'll figure out which one. Okay. Thank you, Thank everyone. Thank you very much.